Well, hello there, and thank you so much for joining me once again today. This is Fatine Grzeski speaking to the issues, shaping the nation. And as you can see, I am still very much uh, on tour for the entire month of May and even the beginning of June. Uh, myself and our team dedicated this entire block of time so that I could bring a message to people like you, you and I, who love our nation, maybe have some concern about some of the things that have been happening in our nation and are simply asking the question, what can we do to turn things around? So it was a, a massive 37 day speaking tour. I absolutely loved it. And one of the things I loved most about it was actually meeting so many of you, our faithful viewers and supporters. So thank you so much to those of you that were able to come out to some of the stops, to those of you that prayed for us as we traveled the nation and for those of you that just faithfully support our team so that we can keep at it. It was absolutely wonderful to meet so many of you in person. Well, another highlight of my tour actually happened on April the 29th when I was at the Legislative Assembly in British Columbia and had the opportunity to meet in person for the first time the Honorable Brian Peckford. Now many of you will know him from this program. He is the last living contributor to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. He's also personally suing the Government of Canada right now over breaching his mobility charter rights. And the Honorable Brian Peckford delivered a speech on that day that literally sent goosebumps down my spine. It was so powerful. Uh, and it was so full of wisdom as well. He called it a Magna Carta for Canada, laying out several things that he believes that we need to do as Canadians in order to help steer our nation in a positive direction for the sake of the future. And so I asked the organizers, the, the event was being organized by a group called We Unify. I asked them if we could show some of those clips to you today. So once again, this program is going to look a little bit different, but these are live clips from that speech by the Honorable Brian Peckford on the steps of the Legislative Assembly. I hope you enjoy it. Without any further delay, let's get to it. It's a pleasure for me to be here and to speak again on the steps of this legislative building today and to thank you all for coming. Some of you came from near, some of you came from far. And behind me, if you notice, there are a number of flags. And they're all, they're all very important flags. But there was one province of Canada that never had its own flag until 19, the 1980s. And one of the things I promised when I was running for the leadership to be Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, was that if I was lucky enough to get elected, that I would introduce our own flag for the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. There it is, where is it? There it is. And you have to understand, as other speakers have said, that <clears throat> symbols are very important. I've often been asked what you consider to be some of your most important contributions to Newfoundland and Labrador in particular, and I always have trouble. I always have trouble between the Atlantic Accord, which brought billions of dollars to the province that they otherwise wouldn't have, and other material kinds of improvements. But you know something? That flag will be around long after all those perhaps other improvements mean that much. Symbols are important. That's why the people who are flying the Canadian flag today and flying other flags are so important, because they're permanent. Something like the Constitution was supposed to be. Something like the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was supposed to be. You stand on the shoulders of Cicero in Rome, just before Jesus, who defended, by the way, this guy Cicero, so long ago, he defended the people of Sicily in the Senate of Rome, where a governor had taken all of their freedoms and rights away and all of their money. He took on the case and he won it. We are taking on the case and we are going to win it. Don't forget the Gandhis of this world. Don't forget Mandela's of this world. Don't forget the Martin Luther King's of this world. 
they all were standing on all their shoulders to stand for something that suddenly the majority and the narrative has dispelled with, has eliminated from our lives. So I want you to remember that we're part of history. We, we can, and I have for a long time, talked about all the things are, that have happened and all of the leaders who have let us down. And I want to not only criticize today, I want to offer solutions, okay? I just don't want her, I want to offer solutions. And I want to listen to, I want you to listen to me, I know you're gonna to listen to me closely anyway, I want you to listen to me even more closely. This is a proposal to reclaim Canada. This is a proposal that I call, as Doctor before me just said, the Magna Carta of today. And here's what we, the Canadians, citizens of Canada, gathered here today, I hope you will vote by your applause later to support the following. Okay, number one. An independent public national inquiry to examine whether government, federal, provincial, and territorial mandates and lockdowns were necessary and constitutional. People in government and their agencies who are found guilty of breaking the law after due process must be brought to justice. Such an inquiry, such an inquiry cannot be led by the governments of Canada who are the major subjects of the inquiry. Instead, a citizens group must be formed for that purpose. And these governments and their agencies must open their books and release to the inquiry and to all the public all the necessary relevant information concerning their actions during the pandemic. We talk accountability, this is accountability. Number two. This is a tough one to swallow, as a lot of the other ones I mentioned are going to be tough to swallow. All registered political parties in Canada, federal, provincial, territorial, must be obligated by law to publish audited financial statements annually. Do you know that right now none of the federal political parties who are in the House of Commons publish any other financial statements. Why should we entrust them with our money? With our money, uh, billions and billions each year in government taxation if they won't show us their books for their own parties. That's puzzling, isn't it? When I uh, published my leadership campaign expenses, audited financial statements, when I ran for the leadership of the Con Progressive Conservative Party of Newfoundland, there was silence. No other leadership candidate at the time did it, and I don't know how many leadership candidates across the country have ever did it since, provincially or federally. Audited financial statements when I took over the leadership of the province. I made sure that's pretty basic, isn't it? Isn't that basic? Number three. No member of parliament or members of provincial legislatures or territorial assemblies can sit in these chambers if they have broken a Canadian law as determined by a court or an ethics or conflict interest commissioner. should we have lawbreakers be lawmakers? Doesn't that sound reasonable? That anybody who breaks the law can't sit in our parliaments to make laws? Number four, every private member's bill a resolution presented before a parliament in Canada must be debated and voted upon within six months of the parliamentary sitting. You go and ask an MP after this thing is over, your MP, ask him if he put a private member's resolution on the table tomorrow in the federal parliament, when would it be heard? 
Three years. Three years. Four years. Depending on how long before the next election and then the election gets in the way, a new parliament is formed, he's got to reintroduce it again. Every MP who's elected by you and your constituency, you should have the assurance to know that your MP that just was elected to go to your federal parliament, if he wants to enter resolution on your behalf or behalf of the citizens of that constituency, should be debated in that parliament in a reasonable period of time. Yeah. How about this one? Going to get in a lot of trouble on this one. <laughs> All judges of the Supreme Court of the provinces and of the courts of appeal, the federal courts and the Supreme Court of Canada must, by law, have criteria established as to their qualifications to serve. Not something that was passed by one department, but a special law of the parliament of what qualifications you must have to even apply to be a judge. government nominated candidates for those positions must be subject to a hearing by a parliamentary committee who would present to full parliament their recommendations to approve or reject any nominated judge. Parliament's decision is final. One time, ten years ago, I would never say this. I would, I would respect our traditions, that we could really trust our traditions that things would be done properly. But we know now, we know now, we haven't proven to us in spades that we cannot trust that system which does not come through Parliament but which is done by the Prime Minister and the Minister of Justice and with the Judicial Council and other people who are going to recommend and then they get, they get nominated, not be nominated, they get approved to be the judges of this country. We now know that the people must be more involved but who controls the law of this country? <laughs> who interprets the law of this country? If in fact, as all the political philosophers say, the final thing rests with the people, then it should happen to this too. Thank you. All parliamentary committees of all Canadian parliaments will have safeguards whereby the majority of the committee cannot close down those committees when the business of the committee has not been completed. <laughs> Just across the street here, we have Jody wilson Rabo, who was the Minister of Justice and who was summarily, right? attacked by her own government to change her department's mind on a regular course of business dealing with a very large corporation in this country. And after all of that was over, and she didn't buckle, right, then she went to a parliamentary committee to tell her story. And what happened when she went to a parliamentary committee to tell her story? The committee suddenly closed down even though she had more to say. How could that happen in a democracy? How could that happen? We must ensure in the future that parliamentary committees in the territories, in the provinces, and in the federal parliament are not closed down when there's a legitimate witnesses available to tell more testimony about the subject of that parliamentary committee. And this was a former minister of justice. This was an MP of the parliament being shut down from telling her story by who? By parliament. You know that is wrong. And this cannot be, and if these things are not changed, these are the fundamentals of our system. Okay. If these things are not changed, if we don't have honest political parties to start with, how can we have honest governments later? Yes. One follows the other. We love Canada, and we want to see it strong for generations to come. That's why we do this show. We can't do it alone. We need your help. Unlike commercial TV, this program is 100% donor funded. If you'd like to see more episodes produced on important issues for our nation, please consider signing up to be a monthly partner or giving a special gift today. Every gift makes a real difference and all gifts are tax deductible. Together, we can build a better Canada for the future. Visit fayteen.tv or call 1-866-844-0844 to donate today. 
How about this one? Here's another of our new Magna Carta for Canada. All governments of Canada must have balanced budgets legislation in yes. yes. With no exceptions except in time of war or insurrection or the country's existence at, is at stake. And the government would have to prove that. Civics is a mandatory subject in each grade after grade eight. You ask a kid on the street here today, even perhaps a graduate of university, find Prince George on the map, and they will be able to tell. And you all know yourselves, I don't have to explain this to you. One of our big problems today is because we don't even understand our own constitution. And why don't we understand our constitution? Because nobody, we don't have any basic understanding of it because it wasn't mandatory in our schools, it wasn't mandatory in our universities, and we became quite uninformed about who we are, how we get there, and how we are governed. This is mandatory from my point of view. Don't worry, sir. I'm coming to your point. Don't, don't worry. How about this one? The power of the Prime Minister must be reduced. Do you know how many people work for the Prime Minister today? No, no, not the department. How many work in his office? The Prime Minister's office and the Privy Council office, which are both really the same thing. How many work? Over 1,500. 1,500. And he has, besides that, 7,000 deputy ministers and assistant deputy ministers in all the departments and agencies of government. They, that number must be reduced to not more than 500. Now listen to this. And I just looked this up the other day and I even got a shock because I was using a lower number. The more than 206 departments and agencies of the federal government. There's 206 departments and agencies of the federal government, and they employ 320,000 Canadians. So let those departments and those public servants do the work of the Prime Minister's office, because that's what they were elected to do being in the first place. That's what they were hired to do in the first place. Let the deputy ministers and assistant deputy ministers do their job, not have it come out of the prime minister's office. The power of the prime minister and the premiers has become too powerful. We now have an executive government, not a parliamentary government. We have an executive government without a shot being fired. The prime minister of Canada was not acting like he was president of the United States, rather than as a prime minister of Canada. Next one. There must be a three-day public First Minister's Conference annually by all the Premiers and leaders of the territories and the Prime Minister. This must be mandatory to discuss the pressing national issues of the day. All governments must publicly issue written statements at the conference highlighting what they think are the national priorities. Not do a spin at a press conference, not do a, a press release. Force all of the First Ministers of this nation to get together once a year and to issue a public statement at that conference of what they think is important for Canada. You like this one. Canadian courts hearing a constitutional case related to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms must be obligated to consider in their written rulings the two introductory concepts of the Charter, the supremacy of God and the rule of law. No decision rendered without a written consideration in the decision of these principles will be valid. Right now we have courts in our land that have already ruled on charter provisions without even discussing the two concepts of supremacy of God and the rule of law, both of which are in the charter. We had a constitutional expert here two speakers ago. Dr. Lugosi. He referenced this in his speech just a few minutes ago. It's just not me talking this. It's people who studied the Constitution uh, 
at length and comes to the same conclusion that I come to, one of the people that happened to create it and write it, you know. <laughs> Two more. Two more. This is not exhaustive, but if we could get these done, then we could move on to a few more that need to be done. But here are two more. And these are very, very current. Canada, this is another declaration of our new parent, Magna Carta, Canada must remain a sovereign nation. Therefore, no treaty or international regulations of any kind can be agreed to by Canada that in any way erode our sovereignty. We are either sovereign or we're not. You can't be half sovereign, nor can you be half free. You can't be half sovereign. Whatever you think of Trump, whatever you think of Trump, just put it one side. Whether he did it by accident, whether he did it however he did it, when he got out of that Trans-Pacific Treaty thing, and when he got out of the World Health Organization, he was right. He was right. And over the years, many times I have, through my political, active political career and afterwards, I have acknowledged if somebody, even he, I, I was opposed to politically, but if he, he or she said something that was sensible and reasonable and made sense. You've got to acknowledge it if, in fact, it's true. As Dr. Lugosi would say, it comes down to truth. It comes down to, it comes down to the golden rule. Right? And if we are to be a sovereign nation and have control, one of the reasons why, I think I might have said it here on the stage before, one of the reasons why Britain finally said no to going into the European Union and becoming just one political group like the rest, was because the farmer got a letter in the mail in the Midlands of England before the vote which said, next year, Brussels is going to tell you how many bushels of wheat you can grow. Yeah, yeah. We would be no longer sub. That's when the rural Britons rose up and helped defeat England going in the European Union. You don't want somebody else deciding your bushels of wheat then we will reject what the government of Canada and now the government of the United States and other countries are trying to do by amending these international regulations, health regulations, to give control over what they think is an emergency has to be an emergency in Canada. We cannot accept that. We are sovereign. We'll decide. We'll decide. And lastly, Membership in any international organization must be conditional upon Canada remaining a completely sovereign nation. So to those who say that we're only here to attack, to those who say we're only here to attack, let them listen to what I just said. Let them read what we just said completed. Because this shows you we have alternatives that are natural. And the doctors and the medicine people said about the vaccine, the same thing. There are alternatives. All of these alternatives we just mentioned, we can put into practice tomorrow if we had a majority of Canadians on our side. Yep. They would not be able to go against it. If we had a majority of Canadians on our side, we can make change. But the first thing we have to do and it, it's, it hurts me to say it. The first thing we have to do is we have to change our own political parties to be honest and forthright. If we don't, then the rest doesn't change because they've gotten away with not being honest and they know how they can get away then with being not honest when they form the government. We, we, we must do that. We must do that. 
whether you, whether your mother or your father or your grandfather was liberal, conservative, NDP or green or whatever. We've got to come to the understanding now after these past two years. If we've learned anything, we've learned that we must fundamentally change the way we operate as Canadians if we are to make meaningful change and these kinds of oppressive measures don't happen again. A gentleman, a gentleman came up to me over here five minutes before I was due to speak and he said, Brian, when you get up to speak, I'm, 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 I'm counting on you to do something for me. I said, okay, sir, what's that? He said, please acknowledge and get the people here to acknowledge the hurt and the suffering that's happening right now amongst families, small businesses and others who've been hurt either because of the mandates and the Dragonian measures that have been put in, where there was delayed surgeries, delayed specialist appointments, or people who've been hurt because of the vaccine. There are a lot of people hurting, and we must acknowledge that. Not only ways to rectify, we must acknowledge that even out here amongst the people that are here today, you have either relatives or friends who have been hurt by what has happened in the last two years. We must acknowledge that they are here, they are in pain. We have it in our own family. We have it in our own extended family, Carol and I. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope that you were as intrigued and riveted as I was by several of the propositions that the Honorable Brian Peckford put forward there in his Magna Carta to turn our nation uh, around for the sake of future generations. And so if you would like to watch this show again, good news for you. You can go to fateen.tv where it's posted right there. You can also download our free iPhone app, get on our email list so that you never miss a show. And you can also email our team or call our team at any time if you need any help uh, finding this show or any other previous episodes as well. Once again, want to give a heartwarming thank you to our monthly partners, our regular donors. You are the ones that keep us at it. You keep us on air. You've kept us on air for three years and you keep us going every single week because as a nonprofit media organization, we depend 100% on the charitable gifts of people like you who care about these important conversations. So if you would like to sign up to become a monthly partner or give a special donation, Nation today, we would be so grateful. Simply go to fateen.tv or give our team a call at 1 866 844 and we would be happy to serve you or pray for you or answer any question that you may have. Thanks again for joining me this week. Hope to see you next week. Until then, take care.